Chapter 6, Sleep When You're Dead. It's almost 3 a.m. by the time Tristan's car pulls up outside the agency. You're both still reeling from the fire at the governor's mansion. You head on inside, I'll park and grab us some much-needed coffee. Inside, you quickly spot Ruby and Luke, who are already settling in. You got here fast. Apparently Luke doesn't believe in speed limits. On the scale of crimes committed in I, my speeding ranks pretty low. Speaking of which, you were both incredible back there. It was pretty cool helping you chase down the big bad like that. But the killer escaped. Eh, this time. But we uh, were incredibly close, thanks to you two. With you as backup, I know we'll get the guy. Now, go get some rest. I need you back here bright and early tomorrow. It is tomorrow. Mm -mm. Ruby and Luke trade a grimace and slink off as you turn to find Mafalda standing in the doorway of her office. What are you doing here late or early? I've been wondering the same thing. Why don't we talk about this in our office? You glance over her shoulder and see a figure seating in front of the desk. One you immediately recognize. I'm going to believe this is the police chief. Oh, hell. Or your mother. Look, I know there's history here, but I need you to keep your cool. Can you do it? I can try. You swallow hard as you enter. The stern woman in the chair narrows her icy gaze. Maria Thompson, one of the most powerful officers in the NYPD, and your former captain, Rose. I'm sure you know why I'm here. Mm, your husband's been acting a little funny with his assistant, and you want me to do a tale? <laughs> okay, I like that. I'm here because I was woken up by the break of news of murder and arson at the governor's mansion. Imagine my surprise when I heard that the disgraced former officer who's been sniffing around about a recent homicide was there. Don't get mad at me. We both know your detectives aren't up to the task. Someone has to solve these murders, and it sure isn't gonna be them. Let me be very clear, Rose. Catching murderers is the purview of the NYPD. Pardon my interruption, but Albany isn't in the city of New York, Captain, which makes tonight's events wildly out of your jurisdiction. But the Sanja Dormer case is mine. You do know interfering in an active police ticket. Investigation is a crime, yes? With all due respect, providing we stay within the confines of the law, we're allowed to investigate whatever we want. And as a result, you also attracted the eyes of the mayor, Brigham. He is very interested that the police solve it. You mean do your job? I'm sure he is, considering uh, he was having an affair with the second victim. I saw them myself. Before you can say anything further, Mafalda steps forward, placing a firm hand on your shoulder, which means shut up. If this is a social visit, I think we're, uh, we've exhausted the pleasantries, Captain. If you don't mind, I'd like to call it a night. Mafalda, you and I have always gotten along. One thing I think we can have an understanding, but I won't allow Rose to interfere with an active investigation, drop the case, leave Mayor Brigham and the other guests alone. If I catch even a whiff of either of you sneaking around, I'll come down on this agency with the full force of the NYPD. Which, uh, that's... I can think of a few words for that. Intimidation. Bullshit. Uh, we're within the legal confines of whatever we're doing. Without waiting for a response, Captain Thompson storms out, slamming the door behind her. Mafalda rubs her temples, clearly exhausted. Thank you for standing up for me. Oh, don't even start. Tonight was supposed to be a simple fact-finding excursion. What the hell happened in Albany? You sigh and recap the events of the gala. The killer was long gone by the time the smoke had cleared. The governor's mansion was clearly, or nearly, destroyed, and all we have to show for it is a second victim and an NYPD captain ringing, breathing down our necks. Mafalda... We also have a new lead, and a murder weapon. I know this didn't go the way we planned, but that's not nothing. No, you're right. Valda lets out a long sigh, then settles into her office chair and runs her hand through her hair. 
I'm not angry at you, not really. This is gonna be a lot harder now that Thompson's involved. But I can tell she's hiding something, which she'd only do if uh, the involved someone's very powerful. Someone she's trying to protect. You think she's covering up for the killer? I don't know if I'd go that far, but I know she cares more about playing politics than getting the monster off the streets. Listen closely. From now on, you proceed with the utmost discretion. We have to keep our noses clean. I don't want you so much as looking at the VIP unless you're certain they're guilty. Do you understand? My fault it. You can count on me. Besides, the gala gave me a few other angles I can work. Good. In that case, I'm going home to get some sleep before the media storm hits. I suggest you do the same. You follow Mafalda out and stop. Spot Tristan standing on the front steps watching you thoughtfully. He waits until your boss is gone and then strolls over. Mm. Luke caught me up on his way out and warned me against interrupting. I take it we've drawn the eye of the NYPD. Burning down the governor's mansion has a way of doing that. They must know that we didn't burn it down. They do, but us being out there um, at all was excuse enough for Camden Thompson. Christian turns away, unusually angry and curses in Jacobian under his breath. Hey, what's wrong? That's a cursing I wouldn't mind hearing. He takes a deep breath and faces you, eyes sparkling softly in the street line. I just... I was scared back there in the fire. It's something I haven't felt in a very long time. That's normal. Everybody thinks they're a badass until things get sketchy. You don't understand. I wasn't scared for myself. I was scared for you. Trust in caring about people is a good thing. It doesn't feel good. Mm, this is true. I reach out gently touching a shoulder, especially when you can't do enough. I'm glad you were there. If I'd been on my own, I don't know if I would have made it. I guess so. The two of you stand like that for a moment, until the silence is broken by the chime from your phone. Hey, can we talk? I'm at the lab. Assuming you're as wired as I am. Yep, on both counts. See you soon. I have to go. Do me a favor and get enough sleep for the both of us. While you stay here and work the case without me. There's nothing more that can be done tonight. I'm just tying up my report, and uh, if you want to be useful, get some rest. Come back fresh tomorrow. That sounds like a tactful way of saying, go away. Impossible. I have no tact. Now go away. Christian turns to go and then hesitates. Hey, Chloe. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you for going into that fire with me. I don't have many people in my life who would have done that. Of course, but let's never do it again, okay? If you insist. With one wave over his shoulder, he leaves and you head to Ruby's lab. Ruby buzzes you in and you find her holding up a sealed bag in the light, the killer's knife visible inside. Weren't you supposed to hand that over to the Alab or Albany PD? They send half their stuff down here for analysis. When I explained who I uh, was, they let me take custody of it to get the pro proceed, proceed faster. So, this will all be entered into the police system. I just might, you know, share some of it with you first. Thanks. We're lucky to have you on the team. So, did you call me here because you found something? Not exactly. Not yet, anyway. I was hoping you might want to stick around the lab. Uh, usually I'm okay working by myself in an empty up building when a killer's on the loose. Ruby Webster, are you scared to work alone? Uh, scared? No, more shaken. But I could really use company tonight. Maybe you could type in for your report while I process the knife. It's a win-win for everybody. It could be like, I don't know, like a college cram session? Except for scraping blood off a knife in a forensics lab. A diamond choice. Collect Ruby's dossier. Alright, you convinced me. I'll stay. Oh, yeah! This is gonna be so much fun! You and I have a very different definition of fun. If your version of fun does include blood culture samples, what are you even doing? Just tell me how I can help with the knife. 
first wash your hands grab a pair of gloves you can box up some swabs as I hand them to you so I don't have to keep re-sanitizing you scrub up while Ruby tears the seal off the bag and carefully places the knife on the table her eyes narrow as she scrutinizes it let me see what stories you have to tell I just wish we had a body to go with her me too but on the bright side those photos you took should be a big help Thank goodness, went through enough to get them. After all, you and Ruby work mechanically, picking swabs and boxing them up as you chat. You're not a half bad lab assistant, Chloe. If you ever decide on a different career from a private investigator, thanks, but I know my limits. You're way too impressive for me to ever throw my hat in your ring. That's how I felt listening to you at the gala. I don't feel very impressive tonight. Shush! No beating yourself up! Good vibes only in this room. You're literally taking a sample from a bloody murder weapon. Exactly. Managing the mood is very important in this field. I take it you do this often. I usually work nights. It's quiet, peaceful down here. No one to bother me, no one to judge. How exactly many hours do you work in a week? I only uh, did 80 or so last week. 85? 85 hours. How do you find time for sleep? <laughs> oh, we don't. We we literally don't. I, I streamed 70 hours of Dying Light 2, right? I edited a bunch of videos. I voice acted a bunch of shit for choices, right? And then I, like, did a bunch of shit. I take care of two brothers. Literally, what is sleep? Seriously, it's coffee. That's what it is. I have a food done in my office when it gets too late. Ruby, I think you need a lab assistant. I absolutely not. Some busybody getting in my way, making a mess, and needing emotional support. I think you're describing a toddler. Toddler lab assistant. Same idea. I work alone. It's not the alone part I'm worried about. It's the 80-hour weeks. That's... Fair. I'll take it under advisement. Ruby grins, boxing up another sample. So hey, how about you and Tristan charging into a burning building together? Yeah, that was one for the scrap on. Can't say that's how I envisioned my evening going. You two are amazing together. Blech. Really? That's what you have to say about him, blech? You're about to say something snappy in reply when Ruby's phone begins to ring. She quickly runs over to answer him. Dr. Todd, thank you so much for getting back to me so late. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Happy to assist where I can. I'm standing uh, here with your victim's remains at the Albany PD Crime Lab. I hope you have some good news for us. I wish I had more. The fire damage is extensive. However, it could have been worse. I'm told a bookshelf fell near the body protecting it from the fire just long enough. I'll ship what's left your way in a few days, but I don't think you'll get much more. Ruby heads to the computer, talking while she opens an email. I'm about to look over the photos of the victim taken before the fire. Can I ask you a cursory question or two, just to compare notes? Shoot. How would you describe the nature of the cuts? From what's left of the body, it looks like a typical thoracic V cut, almost professional, but sloppy. Ruby squints as she zooms in on one of the pictures you took. That's consistent with the pictures we have of the body. And with what you told me about Sanja's wounds. Any chances you're able to identify an injection spot just uh, above the heart? There's way too much damage to know that, but preliminary blood work does show the presence of some kind of drug in the system. We're processing it now. Should have more answers tomorrow morning. You and Ruby trade looks, lowering your voices slightly. How much you want to bet it's the Nabogliterol. The killer must have drugged Bethany like she did Sanja. That's why Tristan and I barely heard anything. As Ruby flicks through the photos, you one catches your eye. Wait, stop. Look at that. She zooms in on Bethany's side. There's a black splotch half hidden under Bethany's bloody shirt. Ruby's eyes light up. Dr. Don, one last question and then I'll let you go. Do you see anything on the left hip? Mm, yes. There's some discoloration on the skin here, unrelated to the burns. Could be a birthmark? 
how about a tattoo? A circle with three arrows? Yes, that sounds about right. Why, does that help? You bet it does. Thanks again, Dr. Don. That's all we have for you, unless you have anything else to add? It might be nothing, but we miraculously found a few fibers under her nails. They appear to be uh, linen colored with a uh, organic natural black dye. I bet that's from the killer's robe. Maybe Bethany fought back and caught a handful of robe. Mm, it's very possible. I hope it helps. Now do us all a favor and catch this guy. We're gonna damn well try. Ruby hangs up her phone and whines her eyes at you. Well, it sounds like this is definitely the same guy. Not that there was really any doubt. Ruby, how are you doing really? Honestly, as terrifying and exhausting as all this has been, I've never cared about a case this way before. Not that I don't usually care, I do. It's just that Tristan knew Sanja. I heard Bethany's voice back there. These victims are real to me in a way I'm not used to. Whoever hurt them, find him. We won't stop until he's gone, and thrown in the darkest cell we can find. In the meantime, I should get started on my report. You can use my desktop. Just let me know if anything comes up in, uh, from Albany while you're working. Ruby turns back to her work, humming quietly under her breath. You settle in and begin typing. As you work, you notice a familiar-looking window open on the computer titled Dossier, Dr. Ruby Webster. Hey, Ruby, what's this about? Oh, Luke made a dossier on me as a joke. I told him if he didn't send me a copy, I'd use him as a test subject for some new autopsy techniques. You can read it if you want. I'm an open book. Curious, you click on the window. Alrighty, we have Medical Examiner Nose Associates, National Association of Medical Examiners, Sisters and Mystery, Read Crime Readers Society. Notes. Intelligence classified as gifted. Graduated high school at 14, studied anthropology before pursuing a doctorate in medicine from John Hopkins University. Turned down six figures from Dewar Medicus and Neuro Neosynth Labs to work as a medical examiner at Astoria Mortuary. Considered by colleagues to be dedicated to a fault, high activity on the Nick Bastion fan forums can account for lack of romance life. Ouch. Ouch. Ruby, you never told me you're a genius. More like a compulsive workaholic, but thanks. I don't think I've even a compulsive workaholic graduate top of their class at John Hopkins without a dash of genius, let alone um, a 21 and it sounds like there was a handful of pharmaceutical companies that agreed. Mm, are you saying I should make in uh, those big pharma dollars instead of spending most of my life with corpses? No, but I am wondering why you're not. She shakes her head, a glint of distant sadness in her eyes. I spent enough time chasing status to know it's not for me. I came from a family of beautiful extroverts. My father's the life of every party. My mother's the queen of Westchester social scene. My older sister's a model who's the center of attention in every room she walks through. I take it you felt like you didn't fit the full mold. I wanted to. I spent my first years of high school trying to be like her, trying to be her, and all it got me was depression. While I was holed up in my room, I started devouring Nick Bastion novels and binging medical shows. I found myself there. I buried myself in schoolwork, all the other things, like friends, romance, they just didn't matter. Ruby... You shouldn't cut yourself off from people. It's not like anyone's knocking down my door. Mm, I feel her there. It could be the do not disturb sign you've hung over the handle. Okay, Pa, let me introduce myself. I'm Kettle. I'm taking a do as I say, not as I do approach her. Ruby thinks it over and then looks up at you with a soft smile. This is, bar none, the most heartfelt emotional pep talk that's ever happened over a bloody knife. You want to hang out while I start gathering samples for the DNA profiles? It should only take three or four hours to process. I wish I could, but I need to head back to the agency and put the finishing touches on my report. Alright, thanks for hanging out for a bit. I gotta admit, it's nice to have some company down here for a change. So get it as assistant, dammit. <laughs> Not long after you return to the agency with another cup of coffee in hand and sit down at your desk. Coffee sounds nice. Alright, let's wrap this bad boy up. Somehow, like always, you find yourself back there. It's dark, 
Your feet carry you back to the place, the stadium, the tunnel outside the box. 32. Dad, are you out there? Call out for him, but your voice is lost beneath a sea of rising noise. A crowd gathers around a steel column, and the body slumped at its base. Bethany Delgado. The next thing you know, you've been woken up by the periodic sensation of something tapping you in the face. I swear to God, Tristan, if it's you... Back one eye lit open, morning sunlight streams in through the agency windows. Nearby Tristan and Luke are wadding up paper balls. You think she's awake yet? No, I think she's still asleep. You should definitely throw another. Luke lifts his hand to lob another paper ball at you. I must scare him. Boo! Ah! Luke drops the ball and topples backwards in his chair with a shout. Tristan stifles a laugh. <laughs> An even better ending than I could have hoped for. You making all kinds of noises, having uh, some fun dreams. No, uh, your stomach lurches at the memory of the nightmare. Tristan senses the change in your face. Is everything all right? I just had a nightmare. I don't want to talk about it. Tristan nods and pushes a cup of coffee and a muffin your way. Just then, what kind of muffin? Ruby slouches through the agency doors, eyes baggy and a file in hand. Well, you look well rested. Don't pick on me, my brain hurts. Chloe, can I have a bite of your muffin? Mm, you can have two if you've got good fingerprints for me. No prints. Sorry. What about DNA? Uh, I got a full profile of blood, which I assume is the victim's. I also have a trace, a sample from the second individual, but it's trash. I like trash. Tell me about the trash. Degraded touch sample. I suspect it's the killer's, but I can't be sure. If so, it's the most likely skin oil from the outside of his gloves. Hmm, nice pull. Did you run it through uh, CODIS? Yeah, no hits. I even double-checked state and local, just to be thorough. Uh, can someone translate that for the prince in the room? The killer's DNA isn't in the system. It means he has no priors, or at least he hasn't been arrested. He's never taken a cheek swab. If you get a sample from your suspect, I can tell you if you have the right guy. Otherwise, I can't tell you anything about him. Sorry. Hmm. Hey, don't beat yourself up. You can only work with that evidence you've got. Aside from the stuff we talked about last night, there was one other thing. I took a closer look at the knife itself. I don't have a full uh, metallurgical lab here, but I can tell you this. It's hand forged. Like a, by a blacksmith? Maybe. I noticed some engravings on the pommel, etched along the spine of the blade. Let me show you. Ruby opens a file to a picture of the knife. You and Tristan lean in to examine it closer. Murder weapon. Peculiar symbols. What are these, Viking runes? No, it's definitely not Scandinavian. Given what we know already, it has to be Gaulish, right? Great, Tristan. Your wordly uh, type, right? Any chance you can read Gaulish? Afraid not ancient dead language and all that. Then we'll just have to find someone who can. A history professor, maybe? Academia has all sorts of niche weirdos. Hey, hey. Well, not weirdos, damn it. In a flash, Luke at his desk scouring the internet for Gaulish academies in New York. Bingo, here we are. Winston Reese teaches at Manhattan University. The original bad boy of the Cisabline Linguistic Studies. Oh, Lord. I bet you he wears leather jacket and dates his grad students. Hmm, Tristan, you and I will go talk to this guy. Ruby, go home, get some sleep. Luke, see if you can find where the murder weapon was made. Hmm, sure. There can't be that many old-timey blacksmiths in New York who do weird gullish daggers. No offense, Chloe, but you look like you woke up in last night's singed formal wear. If we're going to a college field trip, perhaps you should uh, look the part. Not a bad idea. I have a spare change of clothes on my desk. But you could raid the agency's disguise closet. Hmm, disguise closet, you say? This I have to see. We have a disguise closet. With a heavy saw, you lead Tristan into a back room with a makeup counter and several large wardrobes stuffed with clothing. My fault I brought the, bought the space from a molding, modeling agency. We don't go undercover too often, but this place comes in handy when we do. 
Yeah, but don't worry, I'm sure we're gonna pay diamonds. You lean against the arm of the couch as Tristan peruses the selection. Finally turns to you with a smile, holding out an ensemble with a plaid jacket. This should help us get the professor talking. If seeing you doesn't leave him speechless. Diamond choice. Are we gonna act like the good little student asking the professor for assistance? Like, seriously? I'll take any advantage we can get. You see the spark in Tristan's eyes as his gaze wanders across your body. And you'll look incredible doing it, I might add. Alright, let's go meet the professor. Sometime later, you and Tristan arrive at the university campus. Ivy-covered buildings ring a cheery courtyard, and you scan a nearby map display. Let's see, the history department is in the Blake building. Blake, hold on. I know that name. Why does that sound so... Prince Tristan, Ella Grassley, New York Times. Oh, for the loving crying out. Would you like to offer a comment on the fire at the governor's mansion last night? No. Mark Roos, Big Apple today. Can you comment on your daring rescue of a beloved best-selling author? The clip is incredible. Oh, still no comment. And who's this impeccably dressed friend of yours? A new American lover, perhaps? I'm... Her... Eminence Anastasia. My apologies, Your Eminence. I didn't recognize you. I, I took your date at the gala. Went well? You smile coyly at the reporter, looping your arm through Tristan's and pulling him close. Let's just say more than a building was set ablaze last night. Oh, New York has a very own royal romance blossoming. This is going to explode on social media. Wonderful. Happy to be a service. Now, please excuse us. Do of you push past the reporter and head inside. God, I can't believe they have people following me. They haven't done that in years. Let me go with me. It's only getting it worse as the case ramps up. Remind me to buy a pair of big sunglasses and a baseball cap, then. The two of you entered the classroom of Professor Reese, a tweedy British professor who's just wrapping up his lecture. Next class, we'll talk about how the Gallic Sack of Rome in 390 would go on a fueled century of imperial expansion justified as self-defense. It's a bit of Roman propaganda, I think. We can all agree. It's rather ghouling. A chorus of chuckles and groans in the lecture as the students pack up and leave. Friskin lowers his voice to him. Let me take the lead on this star. We need to it ingratitate ourselves. Not everyone finds your indelicate demeanor as endearing as I do. What's that supposed to... Before you can finish, Tristan starts towards the front of the room. You hurry to follow. Professor Winston Reese? I looked you over from head to toe, noticing your outfit. If you need an extension on your assignment, my syllabus clearly says... No, 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 no. Uh, nothing like that. I was doing some research, and know you're an expert on the topic. We're sure you have a busy schedule, and don't want to take up too much of your time. Nonsense! I'm always happy to aid my students in the pursuit of knowledge. How can I help you? Tristan glances at you, and you nod acquiescence. He offers Reese a warm smile. We're big fans of your work. Oh, really? Splendid. Which book? Oh, so hard to choose. Tristan, what would you say? All of them. The most recent one, especially the part where you talk about how all your peers are wronged. I gasped. <laughs> I do have a reputation for being controversial when it comes to Lepontic grammar. We were wondering if you could help us with a quick translation for a little research we're doing. Just a few characters. Certainly, let's see it. Thanks for your cooperation. Here. Pull out your phone and show him a picture of the ruins from the murder weapon. Oh, oh, I see you've got a, two fellow fans of human sacrifice. Excuse me? The ruins, of course. Atom de Gunnion. It translates to border of gods and men. Oh, what's this for? Uh, an altar? A ritual knife? A knife? But how did you know that? It's a favorite of uh, the... Macaranian hunting column. They inscribed it on all their sacrificial tools. It's kind of a druidic uh, invocation. But how did you come across this? Please, I must know. 
It's from a private collection in Albany. Damn. I was hoping it was an original. But if you found it in Albany, it's probably re revivalist junk. Revivalist? The hand of Ma-Ra. One of those old New York spiritualist groups started in the 30s. Appropriating iconography from the original tribe. Terribly annoying, honestly. A bunch of pretenders wouldn't know the first thing about fleeing a man. You say they appropriated um, iconograph. Uh, was it anything like this? Show Reese a picture of a symbol you found tattooed on both victims. What do you make of this? Oh yes, that's a Maharim symbol, all right. I believe it's a mark of possession. I've seen it on powdery shards, a few headstones. What about a tattoo? Can't say I've seen it, but I guess you could say it. Use it as some kind of cast of branding. I, I can't say for certain. What else can you tell us about this tribe? The abridged version, please. Well, um... They're an order tribe from the eastern part of the Gallia Celtica. Entered Germany a bit unpopular with the neighbors. Unpopular how, exactly? Oh, they practiced ritual bacchanalism. Probably why they were eradicated by the other tribes. Their rediscovery was quite a fascinating story. An American oil man, Mathis Blake, was digging about in Germany. Stumbled right onto one of the burial mounds. Talk about luck. Suddenly you remember something about the previous night. Tristan, do you remember that book from yesterday and who discovered the pottery uh, arrow on the at a German dig site? Blake at all. It was in the Blake Library, wasn't it? Professor, tell us. What else do you know about this Blake fellow? What do I know? In fact, the, the building was standing in was named after him. He was also the founder of the Hand of Mahara, a controversial figure in the field of study. Blake returned to New York after his discovery and made quite a name for himself, gained clout amongst the high and mighty. Sounds like this guy was a mover and a shaker. Listen, the Hand of Mahara is all superstitious hogwash. If I had a nickel for every blind avenue, that, that little historical footnote has led me down. Mm, given your interest in the original tribe, I'd expect you to be the first to pledge something like that. If the Hand of Mahara give a damn about viralism and tude, I would be. The original tribes lean towards the mono -estilica. Unlike those revivalist hacks who worshipped a three-headed goddess called Mahara, a luck deity. A three-headed goddess like this? If I have an image of the artifact from the Ra Raman Medina's house in Chota Reef. Oh, the three of the statue. You know, the knockoff that everyone tells us about? Oh, that's gorgeous goodness. Now that is an original. Yes, that's Mahara, at least the best I can tell. Triple faced gods, goddesses, were a bit of a thing back then. The hand of Mahara, however twisted things around, turned it into something of a leather fair economic theology. They believe the goddess bestowed wealth and power on a few chosen disciples, which naturally included every member. You wouldn't happen to know if this movement is still around? Goodness no, they petered out something uh, sometime around the early 50s, I believe. Good reasons. One thing, uh, does the name uh, Vosagas mean anything to you? Of course, he's another Gaulish hunting god from the Vosgus mountain tribes in eastern France. Any relation to the uh, Maharanians? No, none at all. I mean, other than, than being nominally Gaulish, I suppose. Very odd question, Franklin. What kind of work did you say this was uh, for again? We're wondering if someone might be trying to recreate the cult's rituals today. <laughs> like a bit of experimental archaeology. Oh, cracking. Uh, do you have their information? I'd love to be involved in that. Uh, we're actually trying to track them down ourselves. Oh, they do. Well, I can't say I know anything about it myself, but you know, my old mentor just might. Any chances you could put us in touch with them? She's quite dead, I'm afraid. However, she wrote an unpublished thesis on Gaulish rituals and include Maharanians. Uh, where could we find a copy? 
There should be one down at the um, archival stacks. It's a failing private spawn on campus. Other than this stray student or two. Reese writes down the thesis title on a page, uh, piece of paper. You take it and head out of the lecture hall with Tristan. Thanks, Professor. The two of you walk through the hallway, pausing by a sign on the stairs that reads Archives. Hmm, you know, I'm sure we could find other ways to capitalize on that privacy. Or we could just find the thesis. Hmm, why not both, Chloe? We could do a bit of research together. Diamond choice. Head to the stacks with Tristan. You and Tristan head to the basement of the campus library. Rows upon rows of archive text stretch in every direction. This is the hot college hookup spot. I can't imagine what the appeal is. Really? It makes sense to me. Remote place, lots of nooks and crannies to get lost in. Next, you're gonna tell me dust mites give a certain atmosphere to each their own, oh. Hopefully we can find profiles on Gallo-Roman worship rituals by Helena Witchcomb, 1966, hiding in the stacks, too. Hmm, perhaps we should try the section that smells of disco. As you navigate your way through the stacks, you notice the shelves getting denser and the deeper you go. So, did you do much research in college? Good god, we are not talking about this. What do you mean? I'm just making conversation. You're not as clever as you think you are. Oh, <laughs> that's a no then. I mostly studied alone. Just in snorts and waggles his brow suggestively. Any favorite subject areas? Oh, you could go with anything, couldn't you? Okay, I regret playing along now. This conversation's over. After a few more minutes of searching, the two of you find yourselves at the end of a long row, facing a set of closed rolling shelves. Looks like this is the W's. Let's get it open. You grip that hand crank on the end of the shelf and pull, grunting with ever, but it refuses to budge. Damn, of course it's stuck. Would you like a hand? I promise I won't buy. Eh, you know what? Let Tristan help. Watch him work. Knock yourself out. Mm, are you just gonna sit back and watch? You seem handy. Mm, less back talk, more sweat. He smirks, brushing past you in a narrow corridor. Watch and learn. He plants his feet, gripping the crank and pulls, biceps bulging beneath his shirt. Come on, you stubborn thing. A bead of sweat works its way down the side of his neck. The hem of his shirt lifts slightly, revealing a patch of bare midriff. You're just getting started to seriously get distracted when the shelf gives way with a screech. Tristan straightens up and scans the row. Looks like someone needs to come down here with some WD-40. Alright, let's see. The W is stored here. Which comb, you said? He begins to search at the beginning of the row. There's barely enough room for the both of you to fit back to back. Uh, move around Tristan at the far end. You brush against Tristan as you move around him to the opposite side of the aisle. He smirks. Afraid to search by me. We have a job to do. There's no time for distractions. No distractions here, just research opportunities. You could always see what it's like to not study alone. You roll your eyes and return, rifling through the books. Tristan joins you, the two of you methodically making your way down the row. So suppose our killer is recreating some ancient ritual. What would that mean, you think? I think he's... worshipping. At the mansion before he got away, he said the work is almost complete and the rituals felt almost religious. Whatever he thinks he's doing, I don't know what it's meant for anyone else's eyes. It's for him and him alone. Or between him and his god. As you pause, just bought the book you're looking for on the shelf. Which comes thesis founded. Tristan comes to your side as you pull which comes thesis off the shelf and begin to read. Ugh, I'm gonna need a drink for this one. The face of fate. Nowhere is the nature of the Gallo Celtic rich relationship to the concept of predestinary better typified than the Maharin cult and their three headed goddess, Mahara. According to the tribe's beliefs, Mahara controlled the winds of fortune, and thus the outcome of every hunt. To this end, she wore three masks, the kind maiden, the true huntress, and the vicious crone. With Jamask, Mahara wore on a given hunt, depending on what was sacrificed to her beforehand. Her favorites were said to be include jewelry, fine weaponry, sex offerings, and blood, usually in the form of vital organs. So, heart. Organs. 
perhaps like a heart. We're definitely on the right track. The thrill of puzzle pieces locking into place. You snap a picture of the page and then slide the thesis back onto the shelf. Alright, let's get out of here. Eh, yeah, here, I thought that was gonna be longer. All done already, we never even got to the fun part. What far part where uh, you pretend to be interested in me and I pretend to believe it? He cocks his head curiously as if taking your words as a challenge and then he takes a step closer. Who says I'm pretending? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna brush him off. <laughs> like, I think you're trying a little too hard. You plant a single finger on his sternum and cheerfully push him back. Don't get any ideas, Prince. We're done here. Yes, detective. Tristan coolly turns and heads for the exit. You roll your eyes and follow him. You and Tristan leave the building and stroll across the campus courtyard again. I guess we owe our creepy professor friend some thanks. Yeah, I'll send him a basket. God, he was creepy, wasn't he? I thought we'd never get out of there. Walk side by side in silence, the events of the past few days swirling in your head. One piece of information in particular seems to keep floating in the surface. You draw in a deep breath and turn towards him. I've been meaning to ask, when were you going to tell me you had a fiancé? I take it you talked to Marjorie, or was it Olivia? Does it matter? No, I suppose not. Come on, if we're going to rip this band-aid off, we better get comfortable. You follow Tristan across the courtyard. The two of you sit by side by side in the shade of an oak tree. He's silent for a while, watching students stroll past. How much do you know already? I know your fiancé went missing from a yacht and turned up dead. I also know you took the blame, willingly, even though two very smart women seem to both think you didn't do it. I'm sensing an unspoken question. I'm not gonna ask if you killed her, if that's what you mean. Why not? It's a fair question. Tell me how you don't strike me as the time, but I do want to know what happened. He gives a dry, mirthless laugh, looking skyward. We borrowed my father's ship. It was supposed to be a two-day pleasure cruise around the islands for her birthday. His voice is level, but you notice his hands fidgeting in his lap. Let's just say it didn't go planned and leave it at that. There's a lot missing from that story. I'm sorry, this is just... It's more difficult for me to talk about than I thought. If if it's all the same, could we just... Save the gory details for another time? Fine, if you answer one question. Why take the blame? Everyone else needed someone to unload their grief onto. I did my part. But it wasn't your fault, right? I did my part. I should have mentioned it sooner, I just wanted to put it behind me. I get it. You're not the only one with some skeletons in the closet. You find yourself thinking about the stadium, the hallway, and then you feel Tristan's warm hand slide over your upturned palm in the grass. There's a lot you and I don't understand about one another yet, Rose, but wherever you are right now, you're not alone there. Don't forget, you're not alone either. You can trust me to lighten your load. Close your hand, never so slightly, in the tiniest of hint of a squeeze. I know, and I appreciate it. More than you realize. He squeezes back and gently holds the pressure. You feel yourself waiting for him to pull you closer. Maybe he's waiting for the same thing, but when the moment passes as quickly as it came, he gives a small nod, and though deferring to your wishes, and gently moves away. Well, uh, back to it, eh? <clears throat> um, right. With the party guests off limit, there's not much to get back to until Luke gives us a lead on the blacksmith. You could go home, you know. No one would blame you. Reach for your phone and check how late it is, and the day it is. But as your eyes fall on the screen, you feel a sudden stab of dread. What is it? My uncle. I have three missed calls. Ring up your uncle's number and hit the call button. And the phone rings and rings. Don't panic. I'm sure it's nothing. That makes one of us. Dread starts unspooling through you. And then you hear the line finally click. Ah, uh, hey kiddo. 
Uncle Tommy, I saw your calls. Is everything okay? Not really. Somebody robbed a damn bar. Completely trashed the place. But you're alright? I'm not her, Chloe, but they stole your dad's badge and gun. That's not all. The kid who swept the place? Manny, he's missing. Hmm. Well, make sure to stay tuned by hitting that subscribe button and then also hitting the bell icon to receive notifications of when I upload the content. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to slap... No, no, smash that like button and the subscribe button if you're not already. And uh, head down to the description below. Links to social media, Discord, and if you like to support me and my content. Without further ado, thanks for watching. Much love and appreciation. And I'll catch you all next time. Peace out.